Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being in person. Thank you for live, coming to the live stream. This is pretty amazing. What do you guys think of the venue? Pretty cool, right? Whew. I'm surrounded by three bars. How cool is that? So thank you again. This is great. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for being part of the community. Um, you can see some of the, the names of the, the, the folks represented here behind me, if you guys can see that. It's actually pretty amazing. It covers academia, industry, startups, developers. Lots of independent developers are here. So it's not the C-suite, not the, the executives. It's the real core of the community. So we're so excited. So let's talk briefly about what we're going to talk about today. We've got a, kind of an interesting lineup. We kind of sit at the intersection of research, open source, engineering. Um, and it's, it's, so it's not your usual conference. Not, we're not going to have long you know, talks about um, you know, science. Uh, we're not going to talk all about code. We'll actually um, have talks that kind of blend uh, the three. So first off, we're going to talk about PyTorch 1, so the core team come up. So these are the core developers. They span FAIR, uh, as well as the AI infrastructure team. Um, we will jump into research. So Jitender Malik is here, um, kind of a rock star in the field. So he'll talk about research and how we use PyTorch. Bill Ja will talk about production at Facebook. We use a hell of a lot of PyTorch. Uh, we'll then go into lunch. After lunch, we have great representation from the cloud providers. All the major guys are here talking about how they're enabling PyTorch in their clouds, developer tools, some surprises as well. Uh, we'll jump into academia. So we have some of the top uh, universities, Caltech, NYU, UC Berkeley, some great speakers. Uh, enterprise labs, how they're uh, applying PyTorch uh, for their research and then taking that into production. And then we finish up with education. We have Fast.ai and we have Udacity, uh, both speaking on how they're scaling their curricula for their students using PyTorch. And then lastly, we have a panel, which is really made up of some of the, the top minds and, and kind of thought leaders in the space. Chris Latner from Google's here, uh, Noah Goodman from Stanford Uber, Yanqing Jia from Facebook, uh, and then Jeremy Howard from Fast.ai. We'll talk about the future of AI and software. And then hopefully everyone sticks around for the poster session, which is going to be out here. There's whiteboards, if anyone has uh, the desire to do a little bit of whiteboarding with everyone. And then happy hour, of course. Let's grab a glass of wine and beer afterwards and hang out. And so to kick us off, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Facebook's VP of AI, Jerome Pacenti and the guy who signs my checks, so be nice to him. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, good morning. Um, so it's pretty amazing that a project that started just two years ago uh, by a handful of engineers actually managed to create in such a short time uh, a really rich and vibrant community. So today, actually, you'll hear from research scientists from industry and academia. You'll hear from engineers that are using AI to, uh, to scale and to create new applications. You'll hear from cloud platforms, Azure, AWS, Google Cloud. Uh, you'll hear from tool builders who are providing new system to the uh, PyTorch environment. And then you'll hear from education providers who are teaching machine learning and deep learning uh, with PyTorch. Now, before you know, I go into PyTorch and tell you a lot about AI development, let me tell you why uh, you know, really PyTorch and AI matters to Facebook. So five years ago, uh, we started actually the AI team uh, at Facebook. And in five years, AI has become really an integral part of everything we do at Facebook. One thing is that we use AI to enhance our products. So if you go on, on Facebook, you ask for a recommendation, the system uses NLP to identify that, and text your friends' comments and put them on an app. We use uh, automated machine translation to allow people from hundreds of different languages to communicate and understand each other. We use computer vision uh, to help people with vision impairment understand what images and videos are about on our platform. We also use AI to really power new experiences. So we use AI to create hundreds of thousands of bots uh, on the Messenger platform. We use AI to analyze the videos that are uploaded on Facebook Watch to create automated thumbnails and trailers. We use AI to power all the augmented reality effects that are in our apps, as well as our virtual reality hardware. We also use AI to protect the community 
to try to understand the content that's uploaded to a platform and minimize uh, the bad content, harmful content, by flagging it and removing it. We also use uh, AI to identify people in need and make sure they receive it, uh, receive help. But even more than that, AI powers the key uh, uh, system within Facebook. When you go to Instagram or newsfeed, uh, there is a powerful uh, uh, machine learning algorithm using deep learning that determines what content interest you more, uh, may interest you most. So Facebook is really one of the key and major users uh, of AI in the world today. And it's in our interest, actually, to make AI progress as quickly as possible. And we believe like, the key to making that happen is to create a community around AI that's open and collaborative. We we'll also create a research group that creates partnership with other academic research groups. We have more than a dozen partnerships with universities around the world uh, for research. All this to ensure that AI is really advancing quickly and making progress and is shared among the community. Facebook itself is really a provider of this research and improvement in AI. And I'll give you a couple of examples of things that we have done in the past year. One system is around uh, image analysis and video analysis. So six years ago, ImageNet was kind of the task that put deep learning on the map that showed that deep learning systems were really uh, competitive for uh, image recognition tasks. Six years later, uh, image recognition has passed human performance. But more importantly, we were able to create systems that analyze images uh, to a really much more refined level. So here I show dense pose. It's able to, just on a mobile, analyze a video in real time and extract the surface of the body uh, in motion. We also created a really interesting machine translation system uh, that we announced just a few months ago that's able to look at two different languages independently and without any example of translation, figure out how to do a translation from one language to the other by mapping the concept and, uh, and putting them together. Now, what the key problem in my team is, how do we take this research and move it to production as quickly as possible? The two systems that I showed today uh, have been developed this year, and it will take us a couple of months to put them in production. But what if we could do that just in a matter of weeks or even a matter of days, OK? So this is really the impetus behind PyTorch 1.0. Let me tell you a little bit how actually it used to work at Facebook. So the research to product fr production framework um, process used to involve three different frameworks. The first one was PyTorch, which was developed for research. You know, it's a fle flexible um, framework. It's easy, easy to use. You use a Python-first design, an imperative front-end, really something that researchers and people exploring new models love to use. Okay, But the standard model was for uh, the model is created by PyTorch to be ported using Onyx to a more suitable framework for production. And at Facebook, that framework was Cafe2, which was really the workhorse of our production systems. Very robust, optimized for scale, deploying all our data centers in, um, in a billion plus uh, mobile phone. And I was pour pouring today more than 300 trillion predictions a day. But the question is, you know, could we take these three different frameworks and put them all in one. And that was the impetus behind what we call today uh, PyTorch 1.0, you know, a framework that allows you to do seamless transition from AI research to production. Now, you're going to hear a lot about PyTorch 1.0 today from the team that has developed it. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about the, the challenges that we solve with PyTorch 1.0. The first one is we wanted to make sure that people could write code once and not have to rewrite it uh, or re-optimize the code to go from research to production. The second is we want to make sure that you had performance throughout, especially for you know, large data set that need a lot of, a lot of computing that's distributed. The third challenge is we wanted to make sure that not only you could use PyTorch, which is great for prototyping, but some for other use cases, you can use different language more adapted to more performance. And finally, we wanted to make sure that people could you know, use PyTorch, deploy it at scale really, really, really easily. So you'll hear more about that today. But before we get there, I'd like to tell you a little bit of also about the future of this, right? Um, I've been in AI, and I've been in software development for now more than 20 years. And when I started, I remember the uh, way of working was you had a star developers, and I've done that, writing 10,000 lines of code without a single line of test, OK? Now, in the past 20 years, the industry has learned to create much more robust software, you know? We have developed best practices and tooling in our environment to make sure that we create software that's of high quality. 
I kind of believe that machine learning engineering is where we were in software engineering 20 years ago. So there's a lot of things still need to be invented. We need to figure out what testing means, what continuous deployment means. We need to develop you know, the tools and environments so that people can develop robust machine learning that doesn't have too many biases and, and doesn't overfit. I also believe that the world, has, the world has changed. And the days where the development of hardware and software are separated is no longer the case. Uh, we have such needs for high, uh, we have such high needs for uh, compute power that it makes economic sense right now to develop specific hardware for specific machine learning workloads. So that's going to be a different thing today. Now, as we say at Facebook, uh, this journey is just 1% finish, OK? And as we go on that journey, uh, we at Facebook and at PyTorch team believe that we need to satisfy three core tenets, right? We want to develop a system that really puts the user at the center, a system that developers and researchers love to actually use, and that's very intuitive. We also really believe in the community. We want PyTorch to continue to develop organically through community projects, through community contribution, and through community events. And we also don't believe in a monolithic fr framework. We believe that the kind of unique style system where you have a lot of components who work well together and let the uh, developer and researcher figure out what they want to use. Okay. Now, today is really about you, and it's about this community. And I hope that you really enjoy hearing from a lot of people from that community, and it will really get you excited to participate to it. Thank you. And for the next session, I'll introduce Sumith. If you don't know Sumith, uh, go talk to him. He's really the spirit uh, behind PyTorch, and he'll tell you more about all the good things in PyTorch 1.0. Thank you. Hey, guys. How's it going? Man, this is incredible. It's just incredible to see all of you come here. Un unbelievable. Um, and I was just catching up in the morning with every, like, a bunch of you came from like 12 hour flights. Uh, I'm still, you know, it's sinking in, all right? I need to do my talk as well. <laughs> so, so one thing, uh, I'm, I'm going to start the deep dives. I'm going to introduce what 1.0 gives you. And uh, it's, I'm going to hand it off to Dimitro and Zach and Peter and Tang, who are going to do further deep dives. So to do like a quick uh, look back on 1.0, something um, that now, if you look, start from the first public release, which was 0.1.12, every, um, every single release since then, we introduced one or two major features that you guys really, really wanted. Um, either you gave us direct feedback, or we, we also were users as well, so we realized certain things were missing. So with 0.2, we introduced distributed PyTorch, so you can do multi-machine uh, multi training. And then we also introduced more Pythonic uh, concepts like broadcasting, advanced indexing. And we also introduced um, higher order gradients, which have been pretty essential for a bunch of recent deep learning research. And in point three, uh, one of the things that, that a bunch of you have asked us was, hey, like we're actually doing really small NLP CPU models, and your framework overhead is really high compared to like a framework like Dynet do something about it. So we actually spent like a solid three, four months optimizing our framework overhead, reducing just the framework overhead itself by quite a lot. And we also introduced Onyx support because, as Jerome said, it was our first critical step towards gearing up PyTorch to production. We developed our internals to make sure we can start emitting Onyx IR. And that, that, was, that was when we started also you know, shipping PyTorch models to production at Facebook. And in point four, thanks to Peter JC123, our awesome GitHub contributor, um, who couldn't be here today, we added Windows support, and then we added more engineering to make sure it's robust and shippable. And the other thing we did, one of our biggest API changes uh, that we introduced since release was we merged tensors and variables. And no one has told me they were unhappy with that change. Like, I think it just got rid of so much boilerplate code, and PyTorch code since has been like, in a much happier state. 
So in 1.0, something we are doing is we are investing in like future needs, both on the production side and also to take care of the changing deep learning landscape. So in 1.0, we're announcing the introduction of Torch.jit. It's the PyTorch's JIT compiler. It's a very high-level compiler. I'll, I'll tell you why we're doing this investment, what significance it brings. So if you think about PyTorch, in PyTorch, your, your model is code. You write a Python program, and that itself is your neural network, and there's no real difference. Now, one of the downsides of that is that you can't really manipulate your model or even export your model to another runtime that can run it. Because your model itself is Python code, you need a, an entire Python VM to be able to run your model if you exported it. So with Torch.jit, we're introducing a couple of concepts. Um, one of them I, I'm going to briefly show as an example, and Zach will deep dive into uh, the whole Torch.jit uh, later. Uh, what we're doing is we're starting to add function and class annotations where you can, if you just have your code, and that's just standard Torch code, and you add a function annotation or you do tracing, that code can then be uh, inspectable and exportable. It effectively transforms into our high-level intermediate representation that you can save to disk or execute in our C++-only runtime. And this is very, very important for whenever you talk about deploying PyTorch, whether deploying PyTorch for production, or you want to deploy it to embedded systems, or if you want to deploy it into a large code stack that doesn't want Python in the way, which I think a lot of you have given us feedback about as well. So one need is addressed is production, deployment, and that, that is something Torch did as well. The other thing that we wanted to invest in, uh, again, with Torch.jit, is that we, we want to, uh, as hardware is getting faster and faster, I mean, we, we had good NVIDIA GPUs, Maxwell, Pascal, and then we have Volta, which is so much faster than Pascal, especially in FP16. And then we have TPUs, and we have so many other hardware. We have graph or cerebras, all these hardware that's coming out. And all of them are getting faster and faster. And if you run code imperatively, like one line at a time, there's a lot of optimizations you leave on the table that actually start mattering. So one thing that the JIT can do once you add the annotation is it can actually inspect things ahead of time. It can actually look at your whole program and then try to find fusion opportunities, try to make things faster or more me memory efficient. And that's very important um, as it you know, does these code transformations and tries to like, fuse a bunch of graph nodes together on the fly, not an offline process, but like, as it runs the code, it figures out it needs to like, generate new code. Um, this gets more and more important, as I said, as new hardware comes through. And Whole program optimizations um, in, like, in just like, small anecdotal evidence, like I've seen it matter like 10, 15, 20, 30 percent in speed ups on like, larger whole programs. So I, I think it's honestly a good idea. Like as a PyTorch team, we, we think investing in a JIT for both production needs and for the future hardware needs as hardware gets faster and faster. It's really important. One of the important things uh, I want to point out is 1.0 is not a small number. It's not an easy number to say I'm saying, oh, I want to ship 1.0. Of course, I can call it 3.0 as well. Um, but like from 0.4, which was a pre-release, to 1.0, which is what we generally consider a very stable and mature release, we need certain characteristics for what, what we ship. And, and some of those are like, we, we, we want to make sure people can rely on 1.0 for their critical deployments, for their critical research. They don't want like, nasty bugs appearing here and there. I mean, we had those times in point one, like pre-release and you know, in, like a few bugs here and there. But 1.0, we really want to make sure we tighten things up. 
So today, we are releasing a PyTorch 1.0 preview, which is basically a release candidate build. It has 90% of the features that you expect to have in the 1.0 stable build. And it's available for download today. If you go on the website, you can click on the preview button. It's basically not a separate branch. It's just a nightly build. And we actually, like, I mean, I'm, I'm serious about 1.0 preview being fairly stable already. We run this in production ourselves. We run like the top of the top of the stack master commit at production, and we use it for research every day. So it's not it, it, just because of preview. It's not really unstable. It's actually fairly reasonably in a good shape. So try it. The other thing that um, Peter uh, will be diving into uh, later in a few minutes, actually, is that we will also be shipping 1.0 with a C++ only front end. That's also available for download with pre-compiled binaries, and it's the libtorch button that's there. And I'm kind of excited for all of you to try it. Give us feedback. Please do so, or else we can't really improve the process. And 1.0 is the first step to making sure PyTorch is production scale and production ready. Um, if you don't have particular features, don't get disappointed. They will come as, as we progress um, PyTorch into a more production-friendly environment while making research the central and research and flexibility the central component itself. So I'm going to hand it off to Dimitro, who is going to talk a little bit about what's coming in PyTorch production, not just in the current release, but also in the next release. And 1.0 stable, by the way, is going to come somewhere before NIFS 2018. I know end of summer wasn't really like the best date we gave for the 1.0 preview. Uh, but before NIFS 2018 starts, we're going to have 1.0 stable, committed, and shipped to PyPy and Conda. Off to Dimitro now. See you guys. Hello, everyone. My name is Dmitro. I work on PyTorch and broader Facebook deep learning platform. And today I'm going to talk about. And today I'm going to talk about production challenges, and how, uh, some of the technologies that PyTorch One has to address them. PyTorch already established itself as a very flexible modeling environment for prototyping and research. However, when you have your idea working, scaling it up to a larger data set or shipping it to a tricky deployment environment is often a hassle. Our goal with PyTorch 1 is to expose the high-performance building tools for optimizing your model and do it through the, the same familiar PyTorch product programming environment. I want to highlight that this functionality is fully opt-in, so you can still use your regular PyTorch API for experimentation and basically go through the necessary refactoring and tweaking steps only for the part of the model which you need to get perfect improvements from or you want, which you want to deploy. And our goal is to make this process as seamless as possible. So what, what does bring into production can actually mean? There are multiple constraints which production systems usually pose uh, on, the, on your programs. One of them is hardware efficiency, because in many environments you have very tight latency constraints. And also, just when you're running on really huge scale of hundreds of thousands of servers, even small performance regression can basically increase your cost dramatically. Scalability usually means scaling to a much larger data sets with billions of images or hundreds of billions of training rows, and also scaling to multiple millions of simultaneous requests in inference. And there are, of course, all the platform constraints imposed by the broader context in which neural networks neural network models are running it. For example, in some cases like uh, embedded devices or robotics, there are pretty tight constraints in like, what's possible or what's not possible to deploy. Luckily, we are not starting from scratch. As you probably know, in Facebook, in the past several years, we developed Cafe2 deep learning framework, which focuses on uncompromising performance and all the necessary tools to achieve it. We used Cafe2 backend for several years to support all Facebook production deep learning needs. 
from data center to several billion, uh, to like more than a billion of mobile devices. We are viewing PyTorch 1 as an evolution uh, which brings all these components and best practices which we learned through production use cases to the same familiar PyTorch frontend and basically bringing the same experience to our, to our deployment world. So let's take a look at some of the features which are part of PyTorch 1 and also some of the stuff which is in the works and is going to be coming in the future releases. So first of all, when you're running on hundreds of thousands of servers, you don't want to leave any performance on the table. From the beginning, PyTorch uh, uses best vendor libraries such as QDNN and MKLDNN, and we are improving those integrations. We also invested a lot of effort in improving basic core library performance, so even simple tensor operations like reductions and uh, strident tensors performance, expect them to run faster. And going forward, we are basically, as we integrate more kernels from Cafe2 into PyTorch environment, operator library basically becomes more beefed up and running faster on many, on many cases. Getting the best performance uh, out of hardware often requires optimizing not only a single operator, but also chunks of the graph, basically multi-operator pieces of the program. For example, it's necessary if you are trying to do some kind of fusion or if you are trying to change the tensor layout for a bigger part of your model. Of course, nobody can optimize uh, for target platforms better than hardware vendors themselves. And that's why last year we started and basically co-created Onyx Initiative, which is targeting this kind of standard uh, model exchange format. So different hardware accelerated runtimes, such as NVIDIA Tensor T or Glow, can be plugged in in, in the broader frameworks. PyTorch already supports Onyx export natively. And going forward, we're also making it easier to uh, accelerate only a chunk of the only a chunk of the model in the broader context without having to export the entire model. And that's coming in the future releases. When you're trying to scale to production level data sets with billions of images, it often becomes challenging. Running on hundreds of GPUs is not easy and requires high reliability. And also production clusters often have like heterogeneous nodes or mixed networking stacks and stuff like that. In part H1, we basically fully revamped distributed backend, and Tank later on is going to talk about it in more details. Well, there is Py in PyTorch, and Python is great uh, as an environment for prototyping, and even if you are doing large-scale training, it often works just fine if your kind of compute blocks in the model are beefy enough. But overheads of Python interpreter, especially like global interpreter lock, are often a, sh like often a showstopper for small models, whether this overhead is higher, or if you're trying to run in your target application with multiple threads and multiple models running on the same machines. Also, in some environments, such as robotics or on mobile deployments, often running Python interpreter is just not an option. With PyTorch 1 and Torch JIT compiler, we're basically building tools to extract only part of your model which is necessary for, for production deployment and uh, export it into serializable representation, which can run on a very small embeddable C++ only runtime, which can be embedded in your target application. All you need to do is basically export your model, link it, with, link it to your application with libtorch.so, and utilize simple C++ API to load your model and execute. So we covered a few topics. Let's now talk about some of the stuff which is going to be coming in the future releases of PyTorch. In order to run efficiently on modern hardware, it's often necessary to utilize lower precision computations. The thing is like 16-bit or 8-bit or even lower pre uh, precision arithmetics takes much less space on the chip and thus far uh, takes less energy and achieve, achieves better computational throughput. With the right tricks, it turns out you can actually train and do inference in, uh, of your models without uh, losing much of the accuracy. In fact, we saw uh, basically gains of several x from quantizing uh, some models in Facebook environments to intate and without substantial accuracy drop. We are going to open source some of the libraries for efficient intake compute for both server and mobile side later this fall. And also going forward in the future releases after 1.0, we are working on smoothly integrating this uh, quantized compute routines inside the PyTorch frontend, as well as giving you like recipes for quantizing existing models. This functionality is going to be available soon. And of course, uh, in some cases, you need to run mo uh, models on the mobile devices, either for privacy or performance constraints. That's not easy and it's often challenging, and there are multiple reasons for that. First of all, there is no single mobile platform. 
you basically have to deal with two major operating systems, something like two dozens of different chipset versions and CPU architectures, and several compute APIs. Also, mobile devices often have like very hard constraints in terms of code size, mobile, uh, model size, and also energy consumptions of your model. As you probably heard earlier at Facebook, we developed lightweight Coffee2Go mobile engine that ships and runs on more than a billion mobile phones. And you can use this engine today by going through Onyx export uh, to, to bring your model entirely. And going forward after 1.0, we basically going to integrate some of the functionality of taking your model and kind of applying necessary tricks to compress it for the mobile deployment as a part uh, of the same PyTorch APIs. So just to summarize, PyTorch 1.0 uh, comes with core features which will address your deployment needs. But it's only the beginning of the journey. And we are basically committed to provide smoothest experience for bridging research and production gap and expose all the performance components which we kind of built and learned over the years through the same familiar Facebook, uh, the same familiar PyTorch interface. Of course, as Sumit mentioned, many of uh, these techniques basically require optimization of the larger chunks of the model and basically being able to analyze the model structure programmatically and apply some of the automatic recipes. Our approach is to capture structure of your PyTorch model with minimal changes to your source code. That's basically the goal of TorchJIT and to make this process seamless. And this, I'm handing over to Zach, who is going to talk about TorchJIT in more details and walk you through how exactly it works. Thank you. Hi, and thank you, Dima. I'm going to talk about how we can transition models from research into production using uh, PyTorch's uh, JIT compiler. So when we started and we released PyTorch, we found that people really loved uh, PyTorch's eager execution model. Basically, your model is just uh, native Python code, and Autograd allows you to take a derivative of whatever code you need to run uh, to calculate uh, and optimize your models. Because everything is just native Python, all of your favorite debugging tools, like printing things out, or GDB, or other visualization tools, just work out of the box. And if you wanted to use an obscure Python library in the middle of your model, there's absolutely no friction to doing so. And in truth, I think a lot of the fundamental new models actually start this way, with crazy hacky prototypes uh, that glue together different Python libraries with NumPy and various other things. And we really, really like this workflow. It's been great for prototyping models, uh, for trying out new things. But once you've got a new thing you really like, um, these small amount of models that you actually want to run efficiently need to be deployed. And for this, uh, this Python eager workflow has some issues. In particular, the models are really closely coupled with Python. Uh, the Python interpreter needs to be present in order to run the model. And this really isn't only, this isn't um, convenient or possible to always do, especially true on mobile devices where you really can't ship the Python interpreter, but even on servers where you want good multi-threaded performance and you're worried about the global interpreter lock. And furthermore, uh, in addition to not wanting to have Python around, all the dynamic features of the Python language make it um, really hard to actually run programs efficiently and optimize them. For instance, it's really difficult in just Python alone to perform operator fusion or do algebraic simplification. So to address these issues in PyTorch, we built another way to express PyTorch programs that allows them to be run independently from Python. Just to be clear, we really like PyTorch as today. And so the, the version of PyTorch you use today is going to exist unchanged, and we'll start to refer to this as the eager mode of the PyTorch runtime. But in addition to this eager mode, we've added a script mode to the PyTorch uh, runtime. In this mode, models are expressed as an optimizable subset of Python that we can run without the Python interpreter. This subset contains all the building blocks necessary to build models, uh, tensors and fundamental operators like matrix multiply and convolution, traditional language features like if statements and loops. But it restricts the dynamic behaviors in Python that actually make it difficult to optimize. Because we believe in the flexibility of the eager mode for prototyping, we expect that most users are going to first write whole programs in that form, do a lot of experiments, train models, figure out what actually works. 
but for the small subset of successful models that you actually want to put into production or where you actually need a lot more performance, the PyTorch JIT provides tools for taking code originally written in this eager mode and annotating it so it's possible to run it in script mode. And these tools we provide allow this transition to happen gradually. This means function by function and module by module. We think this is, uh, hybrid use of these runtimes is important because it allows you to incrementally make changes and check that nothing has been broken before continuing. And if, for instance, you need to go back and do some more prototyping on your model, nothing stops you from going back to eager mode for a part of the model to do that experimentation. So to actually do this transition, the JIT offers two techniques, which I'll go into in more detail, one based on tracing and one based on scripting. For straight line models where there's no control flow, like a computer vision model, we allow you to trace the eager execution of your model, turning the trace of what was executed into a torch script program. This allows you to reuse existing eager mode code with very little changes to your module code. For instance, here we have an example. We have a simple function written in eager mode called foo. We can call torch.jit.trace on it, providing example inputs uh, for this function. Our tracer infrastructure then runs this code, recording what uh, tensor operators have actually occurred. And then it records this trace into a straight line torch script program that's then returned as a new thing called uh, trace.foo. This uh, trace.foo can run independently from Python. And as we'll see later, you can save it uh, to disk and load it without Python present. This process works for larger models as well. Uh, for example, in a second example here, we take the ResNet model from Torch Vision, uh, run it with an example image, and we, that turns into a self-contained Torch script module that includes all the forward code for ResNet, as well as all the module parameters needed in a self-contained bundle. So when working with tracing, it's important to realize that tracing actually just runs your model as is, recording what's executed. It doesn't record any of the Python control flow in your model. So while it's great for vision networks that are pretty much straight lines of code, it doesn't work for custom RNNs or any other code that contains if statements or loops. For models where control flow is important, like a custom RNN, we allow you to directly write code in Torch script using a subset of Python. In this subset, you mark functions with a script annotation to denote which should be compiled into Torch script. Because it's an annotation, control flow is preserved as written. Um, so for instance, here we have this RNN example, uh, which is expressed as a script module, which is like the equivalent of a normal um, torch nn.module. Uh, parameter initialization code is exactly the same as normal PyTorch models. But the forward method of this model has a script method annotation that turns the model into a torch script method. You notice that this model has a loop in the middle of it. That loop is preserved as is. And we even allow you to uh, write print statements in there to actually debug your code. It's important to remember that TorchScript itself is a subset of Python. You don't have to learn a new language. And I think more importantly, if something isn't working for you and you want to debug further, you can remove the annotation, and the function will execute as normal Python, enabling you to use whatever debugging workflow you're familiar with. Unlike graph building frameworks like Cafe2 or TensorFlow, this mode still has you directly writing a program in a programming language, not metaprogramming the, the, uh, the construction of a graph. So models still read like traditional programs and are much more one-to-one -one with uh, um, PyTorch's eager mode as it is today. And finally, we allow you to mix and match eager mode code with tracing and writing script functions incrementally. This allows you to gradually move your model over to script while checking you haven't broken anything. And it also allows you to use the right tool for transitioning models for the job. You can use tr tracing for the straight line pieces of your code and only use scripting when you need control flow, for instance. Once you have a model fully converted into Torch script, you can then save it to disk as a self-contained archive. The archive uh, that you save, like in this example code here, contains all the code for your model and all the trained weights needed to actually run the model. Once saved, you can load this into a separate process using our C++ API. Peter will talk more about the details of this API later. Uh, but the, the API itself uses the same PyTorch kernels and libraries that exist in Python today, but is carefully factored so we don't have any dependencies on Python, making it suitable for server deployment. 
I want to point out today that in our preview release, TorchScript supports a small but usable subset of Python. You can use tensors and numeric primitives, if statements, simple loops. You can organize code into modules, use tuples and lists, prints and strings, and you can calculate gradients that propagate through script functions. However, um, we don't support all of the features of Python, and there are a few important features of uh, PyTorch that we don't support yet that you should be aware of when trying it out. Uh, In-place updates to tensors or lists don't work yet. Um, direct use of existing modules like conv doesn't work directly in script. However, you can trace a conv and then put the traced module into a script. And until we support the direct use, we suggest you do it that way. And finally, uh, you can't call grad or backwards directly in a script function, though you could put them outside of script functions and calculate uh, gradients through them. For these three limitations here, uh, we want to be clear that it's, uh, we want to actually support these. We just haven't had time to finish them yet. And our plan is to have these features coming in the 1.0 stable release that will happen in a few months. Furthermore, we know it's important for you to be able to understand what you can and can't use in the script front end. So we've put more details in our documentation online that walks you through what you can and can't use. Preview builds of PyTorch today are available that contain this JIT functionality. Uh, we've posted new tutorials describing uh, in detail how you use it and more documentation about the APIs. I'll now hand it over to Peter, who's going to tell you more about the C++ APIs I previewed earlier. Thank you. All right, hi, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm Peter, and I'm going to tell you about the PyTorch C++ API, which provides flexibility, simplicity, and performance across language boundaries. So you just heard a great deal about how PyTorch 1.0 enables new pathways, whether it is the path from research to production or from eager PyTorch to Torch script. But another path we care very much about is the path from Python to C++ and from C++ back to Python. And the reason for this is that we realize that Python is not always the optimal solution to the problems PyTorch users face, and that sometimes you just have to go all the way down to a language as bare metal as C++. And we want to be able to provide you all with all the support and all the options to use PyTorch even in such environments. So you already just saw an example of loading a Torch script module in C++ for production and inference purposes. And you may already have been asking yourself, what if I need to extend my script module with a custom C++ or CUDA operation? And we'll answer that question in just a second. First, let me give you a bit of a brief overview of what we mean with the PyTorch C++ API. So at the foundation of PyTorch lies a high-performance CPU and GPU-enabled tensor library called A10. You can see examples of creating and manipulating tensors with A10 on the right. Built on top, the PyTorch Autograd augments A10 with the notion of gradients and differentiability. This means our tensors can now require gradients, and we can call dot .backward to initiate reverse mode automatic differentiation. Now, the exciting news is that A10 and the Autograd not only form the foundation for PyTorch, but we also provide first-class C++ APIs for you to leverage these two libraries to extend eager PyTorch and Torch script with custom functionality. So if you wanted to write a custom C++ operation, you would usually want to start by extending your eager PyTorch model for research and experimentation. For this, we released C++ extensions earlier this year, which provide you a way to bind a C++ or CUDA function into Python for use with PyTorch. And then on your path from research to production, you would, of course, want to transition this uh, C++ operation also to Torch script. And for this, we pro provide a me mechanism called Torch script custom operators provide the same flexibility for your Torch script models. And we'll dive deeper into those in a second. First, let's take a look at C++ extensions. One use case where C++ extensions really shine is when you want to call into a third-party C++ library, like OpenCV. So here's a, a minimal example of writing a C++ extension to call the warp perspe perspective function from OpenCV, which PyTorch does not provide out of the box. Here we include the Torch extension header, and then define a small function which accepts and returns A10 tensors, converts those tensors to OpenCV matrices without copying any data, then calls the warp perspective function, and ultimately returns the result as a new A10 tensor. And to then bind the C++ function into Python, 
All you need to do is write three lines of binding code using pybind11, where you specify the name and the address of the function. And this will create a Python module that exposes your C++ function as a Python function. Now, you may be thinking, this, is what, this was the easy part. Now comes the hard part of building the extension, where you have to deal with compilers and linkers and endless error messages. But we actually provide two very simple mechanisms for you to build your C++ extension into PyTorch. The first on the left uses setup tools, where you write a very short setup.py file, shown here, where you create a CPP extension object, pass it the name and source files of your extension. And when you run setup.py build, we create a Python module for you that uh, exposes your C++ function as a regular Python function. And on the right, we have an even simpler mechanism, which we call just-in-time extensions, where you can actually embed the compilation of your extension into your training script. So when you call torch.utils.cppextension.load, we will compile the extension for you in the background the first time you call this function, and then basically serve you the resulting Python module on a silver platter. And ultimately, the end result, whether you set up tools or just-in-time extensions, is that you can import your extension as a Python module alongside Torch, and then use it with PyTorch tensors, PyTorch NN modules, and anything else in PyTorch, even though you wrote your function in C++. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, when you do want to transition from eager PyTorch to Torch script, you will, of course, want to take your custom C++ or CUDA operations with you. And fortunately, that is very easy. Let's go back to our C++ extension. All we needed to do to bind this into Python were three lines of pybind11 at the bottom. And to now instead bind the C++ operation into Torch script for use in your production or inference environments, we just have to change those three lines into these two lines where we call torch JIT register operators and tell the torch JIT compiler about our custom operator. And this will allow us to use this custom operation inside torch script functions, torch script methods, and of course, torch script modules, even and more importantly, in the pure C++ serialized format that you'll want to load in your production server. So with, uh, with a torch script, you already saw that you can load your module in directly in C++ without any Python dependency. However, at this point, we still expect you to do your training in Python. And that's great, right? We, we love Python. And if you can use Python, you probably should use Python. However, there are scenarios where you can or, or want to or need to also use C++ for training. For example, you may want to do a reinforcement learning research for a game like StarCraft or Dota and are dealing with a high-performance C++ game engine. Integrating Python into such a low latency, bare metal game engine for such a game would probably be very tricky. So for such scenarios, we are now releasing in beta the C++ frontend, a pure C++ alternative to the Python eager frontend. With the C++ frontend, we aim to provide the aesthetics of PyTorch in pure C++ to enable research in environments that are either low latency, bare metal, heavily multi-threaded, or already written in C++, all domains that are generally tricky to use Python in. So you may be thinking, all right, we, we gain the ability to train in C++, but what do we lose in terms of the flexibility and aesthetics that Python provides to me? And the answer is actually not that much. Let's take a look. Here on the left, you see the definition of a module in the, Py in the C++ frontend. And on the right, you see the equivalent definition in the Python frontend. As you can see, they are quite similar. And there are very few differences beyond the syntax of the two languages. And the same is true for the training loop, on the left in C++, on the right in Python. And what this means is that if we have to or need to port our Python model from Python to C++, we can do so with very little effort and keep iterating fast. And beyond the similarity in the APIs of the two frontends, we also aim to generally keep the architecture and design of the two aligned. So on the C++ front end, we also provide a high-level torch and then package for neural network functionality. We provide optimizers. We provide data sets and data loaders. We have a serialization format to checkpoint your training. And then beyond that, we also have modules for interoperability between C++ and Python and C++ and the torch script JIT compiler. And that's all I got. Thank you very much. Uh, please do try out the C++ API, the Torch Script custom ops, and the C++ extensions. We have very extensive documentation for these. And please let us know how you like them. Thank you very much.
Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tang, and actually, I'm a software engineer from Facebook AI Research. So today, I will talk about the distributed training in PyTorch 1.0. And this work is a joint collaboration between Peter from distributed AI team from Facebook and myself. So firstly, I would like to talk about the significance of scalable distributed training. As you all know, Compared to the traditional single node, single GPU training, distributed training is basically using more resource in parallel, such that the model training can be performed faster. However, distributed training requires a lot of GPU to GPU and host to host communication, which is generally very expensive. So if the communication overheads are high, they can easily amortize the benefit and the computation time reduction due to the parallel execution in the distributed training. In other words, your model training will not be scalable. So since the ultimate goal of doing distributed training is basically to significantly reduce the training time by providing great speedups, so that's why enabling scalable distributed training is very important. So reducing the training time not only allows the user to train, one, train, more, train out more data and the larger models, but this also enables them to do a great amount of model explorations. So therefore, that's why we put a lot of focus on scalable distributed training in PyTorch 1.0. So as you all know, PyTorch distributed functionality is not something new, and we had had it for a year since version 0.2. So what is really new in PyTorch 1.0? So sh the short answer is, it's brand new. In PyTorch 1.0, the design, we designed a brand new performance-driven distributed backend called the C10D library. Send so this performance-driven distributed library backs up the entire PyTorch distributed functionality, which is from the front end interfaces to the di distributed data parallel. Here are the, some of the highlights of PyTorch 1.0 distributed. So first, we have brand new backend design. We have redesigned the distributed backend library C10D, and this new library C10D is fully asynchronous, unlike the previous versions. So in the new C10D library, we have provided both Python and C++ support. This is especially useful, considering more and more people are now using C++ and to train their models. And with this async design, we also make the user API fully, fully backward compatible. The second highlight is highly scalable performance. Scalable distributed training is very, very important, as we talked about earlier. So the scalable performance essentially make our framework fast. Being fast really means near the roof line performance on the key workloads. And we put a great focus on data parallel performance since it covers many, many use cases. The performance improvements includes both the case of single GPU, single node, sorry, single node multiple GPU training, as well as multiple node distributed training as well. This is what we're going to talk about later. So now let's take a quick look at the design feature for C10D library. So the new library backing up distributed is based on three backend collective libraries. Glue, which is Facebook's in-house collective library supporting both CPU and GPU. And Nico put a lot of focus on GPU and also MPI. For all the three backends we support, we have made all collective calls asynchronous for performance reasons. All collective, both Python and C++, are provided to the user such that the user can simply just use C10D as a library itself if they just want to do distributed training or data transfer. So performance-driven design. We hide a lot of performance optimization underneath the user such that the user doesn't have to really like, take care of the performance optimization. They can just use the library, and the library can provide the performance benefit. What is more? In the upcoming work, we also plan to add fault tolerance and elastic training support to basically get more reliable distributed training. This applies to the case when a node dies, your training can still go in, be ongoing without any sort of interruptions. So as a distributed library itself, this is a, na this is a native fully async API we provide to the user on both C++ and Python. Let's take the Python, for example, on the left side. As a user, to use async collectives, all you need to do is create a process group. can be based on different backend, like process group glue, process group nickel, that will perform the collectives. Then you start a couple of, couple of collective calls. In this case, it's all reduced on different tensor, for example. Each all reduced op will basically return a future as an async op. 
And all you need to do at the very, very end is to wait on these features. The same applies to the C++ API as well on the right-hand side, as you can see. OK, so even though we designed a new distributed library, fully async, and actually the previous version of torch.distribute is fully synchronous, we still provide a very fully backward compatible torch.distribute API for existing users. In the front end API, every collective now has an additional parameter called async op that defaults to false. In the default mode, nothing is going to be changed. Then, of course, you can also use the async mode by setting async op to true. What that instead is going to basically reply, uh, return the async op, async worker, then basically wait on that future. Very simple to use. Another optimization highlight we have done for distributed in PyTorch 1.0 is distributed data parallel, which is basically backed up by the CTND library. As we all know, distributed, distributed data, dis data parallel distributed training covers a lot of the use cases, and we therefore really want to make it fast. Compared to the previous data parallel we implemented in distributed, we have done pretty good performance optimizations. First, as I mentioned earlier, communication is very expensive, and we would really like to amortize it. A very smart way of to, to do it is to overlap it with GPU execution. As you know, as a backward goes through each layer, some of the gradients are going to be available earlier than the others. That's why we can always all reduce these, and they can potentially overlap with further backward computation. Second, there are many gradients to be sent over the network, and some of them are really small. Therefore, we collapse them into a big tensor before sending them to basically reduce the number of all reduced operations that can potentially improve the performance. As you see at the bottom, the, the bottom graph shows the actual NVIDIA visual profiler timeline. This is for ImageNet. So as you can see, Stream 21, which is a dedicated Nikko CUDA stream that is actually managed by C10D library. And we can see completely overlapping between the Nikko all reduced kernels and actually the backward kernel in the default stream. And due to the default of 25 megabytes of bucket we implemented in data parallel, the number of all reduced kernels is only a few instead of many. So this basically shows the two sort of optimization reflecting in the profiler. Now let's take a quick look at the performance, which is really what we care about. I will first talk about the single node performance, because it's actually the baseline. So the single node distributed training is currently the fastest way to train on a single node with multiple GPUs using data parallel. So imagine you have one node with eight GPUs. Instead, you can basically launch like eight processes, and each process is going to work on a single GPU and do distributed training. So since PyTorch 0.3, fast single node distributed training is not possible. And the people will generally use data parallel module, which achieves 2,700 images per second for ResNet 50 on one single DGX1 node with NVIDIA 8X V100 GPUs. This is only 81% of the efficiency, which is not good. In PyTorch 0.4, we added a faster single node distributed training using the nickel backend of the distributed library. And this brings the perf to 3,200 images per second. And this actually is the FB32 as well. And this is already at 97% of efficiency. In PyTorch 1.0, with the new backend, brand new design, we maintain the same performance at 97% of efficiency. What this really, really means to the user is that there's only 3% of the communication overhead involved with eight GPUs compared to one. So as a single node performance near the roof line, for a single node training with very fast NVLink inter-GPU inter connections, you might not be able to see a huge performance gain. However, if the training is done on host with slower inter-GPU connect, like PCI Express, you might see some sort of performance improvement due to the communication overlapping, as we talked about earlier. With a very close to roof line, single node baseline, now let's take a, look at this, take a look at the scalability of multiple nodes. First, let's take a look at example for ImageNet ResNet 101, a vision model. This diagram shows the speed ups compared to the single node performance by scaling the number of nodes from one to eight. And the green bar shows ideal speed up. For the eight node, actually, the ideal speed up is going to be eight. We here demonstrated two kind of hardware network configs. So basically, every node 
is an ADAX V100 host interconnected with either four 100 gigabits of infinity band or one single Ethernet with 100 gigabits of Ethernet as well. So as it shows, it scales pretty well. In the case of eight nodes, 64 GPUs, we have about 7.5 speedups and 5% of communication overheads for the, for the case of InfiniBand. And for the case of Ethernet, it still linearly scales pretty well and achieves 7.2 times of the speedup and 10% of the communication overhead. Another example would be FairSeq, which is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, transla machine translation model developed on Facebook AI research. The left figure shows a similar sort of speedups result from one to eight nodes. As we can see, it scales pretty well and with over 6x speed up with eight nodes. You might wonder why it doesn't scale not as linearly as the previous model. The reason is that FairSeq is a much, much larger model that has a lot more data to be transferred over the wire. The second one is uneven batch size, which basically means the worker can get a different batch size due to the nature of the model itself, and the performance is basically limited by the slowest worker because it has to do the asynchronous uh, communication at the very end. So the right figure shows a training time reduction. So going from one to 16 DGX1 nodes brings the total training time from five hours to half an hour, which is really amazing. And this is about 19% of performance gain when we switch to C10D DDP, distributed data parallel, for a fair seek, thanks to the overlapping optimization we have done. So Michael will have a talk about fair seek later, can provide more details. So OK, where can you find all these? So all these new features of distributed on PyTorch Master were on the nightly views. So the old torch.distributed API are now deprecated to torch.distributed.deprecated. So this pretty much covers the highlights of the distributed in PyTorch 1.0. And thank you. So uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, be back here at 10.55. Um, in the meantime, shameless plug for the community. So Philip and Brian uh, have a new book coming out in January, but I think you can pre-order it now. So uh, NLP uh, on PyTorch. So see you guys in about 15, 20 minutes. Thanks. compared to one. So as a single node performance near the roof line, for a single node training with very fast NVLink inter-GPU inter connections, you might not be able to see a huge performance gain. However, if the training is done on host with slower inter-GPU connect, like PCI Express, you might see some sort of performance improvement due to the communication overlapping, as we talked about earlier. With a very close to roof line, single node baseline, now let's take, like this, take a look at the scalability of multiple nodes. First, let's take a look at example for ImageNet ResNet 101, a vision model. This diagram shows the speedups compared to the single node performance by scaling the number of nodes from one to eight. And the green bar shows ideal speedup. For the eight node, actually the ideal speedup is gonna be eight. We here demonstrate two kind of hardware network configs. So basically, every node is an ADAX V100 host interconnected with either four 100 gigabits of infinity band or one single Ethernet with 100 gigabits of Ethernet as well. So as it shows, it scales pretty well. In the case of eight nodes, 64 GPUs, we have about 7.5 speedups and 5% of communication overheads. For the, for the case of InfiniBand. And for the case of Ethernet, it still linearly scales pretty well and achieves 7.2 times of the speed up and 10% of the communication overhead. Another example would be FairSeq, 
which is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, transla machine translation model developed on Facebook AI research. The left figure shows a similar sort of speedups result from one to eight nodes. As we can see, it scales pretty well, and with over 6x speedup with eight nodes, you might wonder why it doesn't scale not as linearly as the previous model. The reason is that FairSeq is a much, much larger model that has a lot more data to be transferred over the wire. The second one is uneven batch size, which basically means the worker can get a different batch size due to the nature of the model itself, and the performance is basically limited by the slowest worker because it has to do the asynchronous uh, communication at the very end. So the right figure shows a training time reduction. So going from one to 16 DGX1 nodes brings the total training time from five hours to half an hour, which is really amazing. And this is about 19% of performance gain when we switch to C10D DDP, distributed data parallel, for FairSeq, thanks to the overlapping optimization we have done. So Michael will have a talk about FairSeq later, can provide more details. So OK, where can you find all these? So all these new features of distributed on PyTorch Master were on the nightly builds. So the old torch.distributed API are now deprecated to torch.distributed.deprecated. So this pretty much covers the highlights of the distributed in PyTorch 1.0, and thank you. So uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, be back here at 10:55. Um, in the meantime, shameless plug for the community. So. Philip and Brian uh, have a new book coming out in January, but I think you can pre-order it now. So uh, NLP uh, on PyTorch. So see you guys in about 15, 20 minutes. Thanks.